Hello and welcome to a new session for this online course on introduction to embedded system design. I am your instructor Dhananjay Gadre. This is a very important uh, session in which we are going to uh, go through certain steps so that appropriate software is installed on your desktop or laptop computer whatever you may be using. And so, we are going to uh, deal with two installations, one is the software called Git and the other is the Code Composer Studio which is the C compiler uh, from Texas Instruments for MSP430. In fact, it supports many other microcontrollers, but we are uh, going to uh, restrict ourselves to discussion about the MSP430 microcontroller. After the installation of these two packages, we are going to discuss a little bit about uh, embedded C programming. Of course, we assume that you have some experience, you have good experience in uh, general C programming. So, we are not going to consider those aspects, we are going to consider specific aspects to the embedded C part. All right. Now, uh, Git is a version control system. Now, before I explain what a version control system uh, is, I would like to take this opportunity and discuss a few issues with you as a beginner student or as a student who has not yet entered the professional domain, uh, I as an educator with some experience, I would like to share my experience with you. For example, suppose I when I teach a class and I tell them please send me a report about uh, today's exercises that I covered in the class. Most of the time unless I tell them to begin with, I would get 20, 30, 40 emails with the document enclosed and often times the document is uh, labeled or named report dot doc. Now, as far as the student who has sent this is concerned, he is happy he has created a document and he has emailed it to me. But you please uh, step into my shoes and consider that I have received 50 emails and all the 50 emails have pretty much 50 files all of them are named report.doc. If I download and save them, what is going to happen? It will make me crazy. It will be impossible for me to relate a given document with a person. And therefore, I always ensure that when I ask my students to send me reports for a given topic on email, I ask them to follow a certain protocol. In a classroom, in a, as a student, you would have a roll number. And therefore, often times my protocol is you include this information in the file name, you say roll number, whatever your roll number is, the uh, year in which we are doing or the subject we are doing, suppose we are doing EC301 and maybe if this is your first report or if the, this is the first report that I have asked this class to um, send me, it could be report one dot doc or any other file format uh, if it is a PDF fine. This way the moment I get this now roll number has to be replaced with your actual roll number whatever it may be. You do not want to receive uh, 50 emails with the same roll number as a literal word. Here the roll number will be replaced by whatever the students roll number is. Likewise if tomorrow now this is fine this uh, scheme works as long as you are part of an ecosystem where the roll numbers can be used to distinguish person A from B and C and so on and so forth. Now, let me put you in a different perspective. Suppose uh, tomorrow you are going to enter the job field, job market and you are going to send your resume to somebody and that somebody has asked 20 other people to send their resumes. Now, my question to you is what would you send you, what would be the name of the file that you send to that person containing your resume? Well, if it is going to be resume dot pdf, well you have recreated the situation which I uh, explained earlier and therefore, what I normally do when I, when I go on speaking uh, assignments to various uh, colleges for giving a lecture, I have uh, followed a format and I uh, rec uh, recommend to you that you follow a similar format if not the same. I always uh, keep track of my changing uh, activities uh, and reflect them in my resume as I would say DVG 
uh, my initials, but that's because these are very uncommon initials. If you have names which uh, end up having very common initials, please uh, modify it. And then I say resume or CV. And then I also have a four digit number. For example, it could be 0320. And here 0320 is going to tell me that I created it in third month of the year 2020. And this way I am able to know what is the latest resume that I have kept on my files. And the person who receives it can make an idea that this is a resume for a person whose initials seem to be DVG. You can follow a similar or a different format. But the important point is there should be enough variety, enough information in the file name itself for somebody who is collecting tens of resumes to call one resume file apart from the other one. Now, this is not the topic of our discussion here, but is very closely related. Now, imagine, uh, so before that I hope you will uh, give some heed to this uh, uh, ideas that I have thrown at you. Now, coming back to the whole idea of version control system, imagine that you have a PC and that you are creating, uh, uh, you are creating a report like your teacher might, might have asked you to create. Then you write a few pages of a word document and then you are happy with it, you save it, you go to sleep, next day you wake up and say no, 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 I think I can improve this report a little bit. And so you open that file and you start editing it and you spend another few hours and suppose that report was uh, X, Y, Z to reflect your initials report dot doc, all right. And then next day you have modified it, you have edited large parts of it and you have replaced it with some new text and a few hours later you realize, oh God, the first version that you wrote last night was much better than this one. Now what to do? You have uh, deleted parts of it and you have replaced it with uh, new text and you do not like that text. What, how would you solve this? Well, if you are going to do manage this manually, you could say I the night that you sleep happy with the report that you have created, when next day when you want to edit it, you open that file, but now first save it into a new file name. Well, at least some uh, keeping some part of the file name common, but an identifier which tells you that this is a new version. So, what I could do is I could say x, y, z underscore report, the next day I will say uh, underscore v2 dot doc. And now I have my file xyz report dot doc on my folder. I have created a copy of that and I renamed it as xyz report underscore v2 and I can edit it. And if I am happy with the v2, I can retain v2. If not, I can always go back to the original uh, xyz underscore report. And this way you can keep on creating newer and newer versions of your report. Uh, keeping the newer versions if you are happy with it and reverting back to the older versions if you are not happy. And so these stages while you start from the beginning of your file to some conclusion, uh, conclusion of this whole exercise, you have created perhaps multiple versions of that file. And this allows you to at least keep track of the changes that you have made. Now of course, if you did it manually, it will be a nightmare to uh, have so many files on your system. This is where an automatic version control system or creating documents under the supervision of a software which keeps track of these changes comes into picture. Now, till now what we discussed was in the context of a one person, you as an individual creating documents and uh, you could uh, extend this analogy to not just creating documents, but also to create software uh, files. You write a piece of code, you are happy with it and you want to make changes, you make changes which ends up making it worse than what it was earlier. So, uh, when I say documents, it could be uh, word documents or it could be text documents, it could be code files, it could be anything else. This uh, whole discussion applies to all of it. Uh, so, uh, imagine that uh, you were working on a project in which there were uh, three or four files and it was being worked on by a few people who were not uh, geographically present at the same location that is they were distributed across the town or across the city or maybe across the world which is quite common these days. Now imagine that all of you wanted to access files, make changes to those files and it is possible that 
the changes that you made uh, made the whole uh, new version worse than what it was earlier. And so, you not only need to create, you not only need to take care of these files, the changes that you are making through an automatic piece of software, but you also need a single source or single repository, single location where these files will be accessible to all the people who are working on it. And in fact, uh, the whole uh, cloud based uh, storage of files, maybe a Google Doc is an example of that. But in this context, we are going to use specific software created to uh, facilitate keeping making newer and newer versions of the project that you are working on, whether that project is writing a book, writing a report, uh, creating a schematic file, uh, creating code software, no matter what. This uh, version control system uh, can take care of all of it. Now, there are of course, a lot of version control systems. Some of them are paid, many of them are paid, but there are some which are open source and free for you to use. And we have selected one such, which is quite popular and quite common, uh, and that is called Git. Now, what we want you to do is that we want you to become familiar with Git and you can become familiar uh, with Git by beginning to use it. If you already know Git, well, you can uh, uh, skip this initial part of my uh, of this session and uh, head on straight to the uh, part where we start discussing the Code Composer Studio. But if you are not, uh, this is a uh, right place to start. And Git is a very complex software. It, it offers you a lot of facilities. It offers you facilities as a creator. It offers you facilities as an end user. And right now, the best way to start using it, if you have not used it before, is to start using it as an end user. And you as a participant, we assume that uh, many of you or most of you have not heard of Git or version control softwares. And so, we are going to show you the use of uh, Git from the perspective of a beginner. As you start using it, there are a lot of resources which will teach you about various features of Git, uh, especially the features of Git. Uh, when you want to use it as a creator and the material that you have created, you want it to share with others or share with other members of the team or share with common public, uh, you could use the advanced features. But right now, we hope that you are a beginner and so you would like to, we would like you to install Git and using this, we would like you to download all the code files and in fact, uh, schematic files and other things that we have shared on a, a repository that we will uh, uh, soon talk about uh, and it will allow you to download all of it onto the computer that you are using. All right. So, to begin with open a browser of your choice that you are using and type this uh, link which is uh, https uh, double slash uh, git dash scm dot com slash downloads. Once the software is download, downloaded, you can double click on it and follow the normal uh, installation process. Once the software is installed, you open a terminal on your Windows PC. By the way, all this discussion is uh, a Windows PC centric. Uh, that's the most common uh, operating system for people to be using. And uh, so we are going to discuss all of that in the context of Windows. So open a terminal and in that terminal find a suitable, create a suitable folder into which you would want to show, uh, save all the files related to this course. So, I leave it to you to create that folder and uh, using the terminal go to that folder and then type this type git config uh, double dash global username and then username. So, for example, if I were to do this, I would on my command prompt on the terminal window, I would say git, I would type this config space double dash global user dot name space and then I will write the name that I want. So, suppose I want to do it as my name. So, I could say D V G A D R E. I close those and I press enter. After that, so this registers me uh, with git with this username and then I say on this uh, on the uh, command prompt again I say git config basically I repeat most of it double dash global 
user uh, dot email double quotes whatever is my email address so if it could if it was dvg at the rate gmail dot com i should type that or if it is something else i should type that by the way this is not my email address uh, so you once you do this it will basically register this software with this username and assign this email address to this user now what do you do now again uh, in that uh, folder that you have created you could do one of two things you could execute this command on the uh, prompt but this would you would do if you are somebody who is creating a repository you are creating a set of files that you want to eventually share with the rest of the world since you are not that you are going to execute this second line and what do you do you type git clone git clone and a url address so which means basically you are going to write git clone followed by this entire address following the uh, uh, the letters and characters exactly if something is in capital you must do that in capitals and when you enter this basically it's going to pull from a, a repository on the web internet called github we have created this repository it will create a local version of the files that are stored on that repository onto your local computer so that you could access them even if the internet uh, connection is not on uh, i'll talk about more about this then if you are going to make changes to the files and you would want to share the changes with us of course we need to agree to those changes and we need to agree to that then you could follow these things but we are not going to right now do that we'll talk about this in the next slide now when you create a, a, a repository or you create a file basically git looks at those at that file in in various ways when you create a file it is still not attached to that software which is which you just installed on your pc that is git now you can uh, from that and that such a file is called untracked file this is the untracked file now and you obviously create it in that uh, folder that i mentioned and then you can add that file into this uh, next stage which is called the staging area and from there you uh, commit it and and now all these initial this these three parts here these are when you are doing it as an experienced user who is creating a repository first of all that repository has to be created this is the repository on your local computer and then you upload it to the uh, internet uh, global repository so when i say install git that git is a local repository now this local repository could be cloned as the word they use could be replicated on a platform that is globally accessible because your computer is not accessible to other users if you as a creator wanted to share your work with others you could uh, move your or you could copy your repository from your local computer into onto a global uh, git uh, or a global uh, version control software website and one of the website is github there are other websites also but uh, we are going to uh, use git on our local computer and github for the internet access so you can push all those files on to the uh, the internet uh, repository on the internet which in this case is github if you notice here uh, you install git but you downloaded the repository that we have created on the github website likewise when you when you did this when you uh, cloned that uh, repository that we have created on github after that uh, you are set all the files that are there on our repository will be replicated on your on your uh, computer in the folder at which you did all this and you are at this point you are ready to use them now imagine the following that let's say you uh, created this clone on your uh, local computer and you were happy with it and then you uh, went to sleep maybe you stopped doing work for a week and a week later you wanted to resume well uh, you need not worry you could open those files uh, in the way that we'll uh, talk about soon but what if we here made changes to those files if we made changes to those files you would not know them you would not get the changed version of the files unless you did something 
And what do you need to do? You need to go to that command prompt in the area that you, in the folder that you created, and you need to pull those files again. Now, in case those files have not changed, nothing will change. In case we have made changes to those files, they would be reflected, you would get a newer version and the local repository on your computer will be uh, updated with the changes that we may have made, we might have made. And therefore, you need to learn to use two commands for that. Usually, you would run this command. You would say git exactly like this. On the command prompt, you just type git pull origin master. The uh, git software uh, on your PC knows what you are talking about, what is the remote uh, host, from where to uh, get it and update which files. In case you don't want to and that will bring into the this so called staging area at which point you can uh, use them in the way that you want. You could also uh, of course when you do this uh, the local repository is also updated or you could use git fetch origin master you can type this in the command prompt it will only bring it into local repository it is not yet available these newer changed files may not be visible will not be visible to you in the work area and then you need to uh, execute another command called git checkout master for the changed versions which have now come to your local repository but not yet available or visible into the uh, into the designated folders so we suggest that uh, each time you are working on these files you just uh, open your computer make sure that the internet is working and then uh, go to the folder uh, go to the open the terminal in the folder that you uh, have stored all this and just run one command which is get git pull origin master when you type it any changes that may have happened would uh, be uh, reflected on the local repository and into the uh, workplace that uh, where these files are stored and so you say git fetch it allows you to uh, uh, fetch these uh, files and you can do uh, but we recommend that you do uh, git pull which will not only fetch it but also uh, store and make the files visible in those folders where the original files were uh, stored. So, uh, this is the way to ensure that any changes that have happened on the uh, git global repository those changes are reflected in your local repository. So, let me revise some of these terms uh, git is a uh, version control system uh, there is a local version of it running on your computer when you install git there is a global repository and there are many such global repositories and git can talk to any such global repositories but we have chosen to connect git to a global repository called github github is where we upload the files that we are creating for you and if you want to synchronize the files that you have already downloaded on your local repository you need to execute this command so on your uh, terminal you just type git pull uh, with this uh, word git pull origin master it will bring the latest version of the file from the global repository that is github in from that file that that link that we shared you don't have to provide that link it knows it will simply pull, pull those files from that repository and update your local repository and then you are free to use them in any which way you want you can make changes to it also doesn't matter of course, those changes will not go and change the files on the global repository. For that, you need to learn more about how to use git and essentially that part is covered here. So, you could use this as a reference, uh, learn more about git. There are a lot of uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, learning material related to git on the internet. Uh, we recommend that you uh, read that if you want to be a contributor or later on if you want to create your own repositories and share it with the world. or created or have a team in which multiple people need to work on such shared files. So, uh, once you have done this, uh, you are ready to uh, go to the next step which is to install uh, Code Composer Studio and just to recap, you have created a clone using this uh, command. If you just want to download the files once uh, and for all without the uh, possibility of uh, synchronizing with the changes, you could, the, you could download just the files using this. Uh, command or uh, you know type this into your browser and you get the zip file which has all the folders and the subfolders and the files inside those and so on. Of course, uh, I hope that you are uh, going to be worried about the synchronization and all that so you would use this command.
Well, now you are ready. Your Git is installed on your computer. You have downloaded the global repository, and you are now ready to jump into the next part of this, which is to install the Code Composer Studio. Well, for that, you go to this website, or you just search uh, Code Composer Studio, TI Code Composer Studio. You would get the link. Uh, go to this uh, or type this into your browser and when you see you will see this there are a lot of options but the top version which is released 9.3.0 is what you we want you to download and we want you to download the windows 64 bit version there are no other versions available anyway so you click on it and follow the normal uh, uh, software download and installation process when you click on the downloaded part it allows you to set up it offers you two options either you can go with the custom installation or you can go with the full installation as i mentioned code composer studio is a c compiler c c++ compiler from texas instruments for a lot of their microcontrollers and processors but since in this course we are only going to be talking about msp430 there is no need to for full installation if you did a, if you chose the full installation it will install uh, compilation uh, ideas for all the processor that TI offers. We, we are only dealing with the custom part uh, that is one part out of so many processors. So we recommend that you use the custom installation. Then you go next and in the next it offers you all these options which you can check out and since as I mentioned we only want to deal with MSP430, check out the first option which is MSP430 ultra low power uh, MCUs and then uh, select next and now you are uh, ready your software is going to be installed shortly and once it is installed we want you to be able to write uh, code files and uh, compile them and download them and so on and so forth of course we don't want you to write code files from scratch <coughs> in the beginning we would want you to use the files that you have just downloaded remember in the previous segment of this lecture we talked about creating downloading a repository of code files and of course many other things onto your local computer. So all you need to tell CCS that I want to uh, edit existing files, you want to point where those files are uh, located and so you need to import those files. So to import existing files you go to uh, file import and uh, in the tab it will show general and then you uh, say that you want existing projects into your workspace and you need to point it to the right directory which would be in that folder that you created and once you do that you refresh select all finish now you are good to go you have all the uh, your uh, code composer studio would know all the uh, code folders that we have created for you they are already installed on your computer but now code composer studio knows where they are and that you want to uh, work on them in case you want to create a new project meaning apart from all the code files in various uh, folders that we have shared with you in case you wanted to create your own new project you are of course welcome to do it and for that you uh, uh, use in your CCS go to file select new and you say you want to do a new CCS project there you need to mention that your target is this this is the MSP 430 G2553 and that the compiler version is this and then when you say finish it will create uh, it will automatically install some information for you into specified areas and one of the important things it will store is that it you have chosen MSP 430G2553 so in the predefined symbols it's going to use this file and uh, in the header file uh, it's going to use this version this is just to illustrate what is happening uh, you don't need to be worried about it once you have selected this option while installation uh, all the files uh, that you create, all the all the code that you write in these files will compile for the MSP 430G2553 microcontroller. Now, once you have uh, created a file or you have opened an existing file, you would want to uh, compile it. Now, of course, compilation will convert the uh, C, uh, C file into assembly and from the assembly into a uh, machine code file. But what do you do with that machine code file? Your idea is, your uh, intent is that this machine code, that is the object code, the binary code should be tra transferred into the memory of the MSP430 microcontroller. And for that, as you know, you would connect your MSP430 lunchbox. But 
just the compilation process is not going to transfer the code file into the MSP430 target. I am using the word MSP430 target because it could be MSP430 lunchbox or you could use any other uh, MSP430 evaluation kit, right? And so, we need to still tell MS, our CCS compiler that once the code compilation is completed, what is to be done with the object code? What we want to tell it is that we want to invoke the bootstrap loader and we can do that in the CCS. So, that I do not need to uh, open 10 windows and in each window I have to tell one part and the second window I tell the second part, the third part. The Code Composer Studio is an ID, integrated development environment, which means it allows me to edit, it allows me to make changes, it allows me to save files, it allows me to open files, it allows me to compile them, it allows me to look at uh, the compiled versions and then eventually it allows me to download the software right into the target microcontroller. And so for that we have to tell what is our way of transferring the object code from the compiled, uh, from the CCS compiler into which way into the microcontroller memory. And since we are going to use the bootstrap loader, we need to instruct the, uh, uh, the CCS that this is our preferred method. And for that, you go to project properties, there you would see a tab build, in that you select MSP430 hex utilities and you say enable MSP430 hex utility. Then you press uh, apply and uh, close and then you do the second step where you again go to project properties, you say build <coughs> MSP430 hex utility, you are specifying the output format options and you select here as you see output ti-txe hex format. There are many ways in which the hex file can be saved. This is the preferred uh, version which uh, is compatible with the uh, bootstrap loader. So, we want you to select this. Once you are done, then you go to step 3 and you it basically shows you that uh, once the uh, build is completed, that is when I say the word build here, it means the entire process of uh, compilation and uh, so on and so forth, what to do with it? It is going to uh, create a, a file name like this and uh, remember this part is very critical. This is basically telling the uh, computer and the code composer studio that the compiled file has to be downloaded, has to be sent through the USB port which is seen as by the computer which is seen as COM9 in this case, right. But of course, in your on your computer the uh, USB port to which you connect the uh, lunchbox may appear to be a different uh, number. So, what you need to do is go into the uh, uh, device properties and find out that the port uh, when you connect your lunchbox it is uh, reflected as what COM number and the way to do that is if you have already connected the lunchbox, disconnect it, connect it again and you see a number pop up into the device manager and that is the number and you should change that, that uh, you should write that number here and this is when you are going to be installing a new uh, uh, file. If you are going to open the files that we have created and which are available to you on the repository, you might find this number and this number may be different from the one reported by your device manager. So, you need to go back into this BSL step 3 and edit this part to reflect that uh, COM port number that you see now. And one idea is that if you have chosen a particular USB port to connect your lunchbox, if you continue to use that port over the period of this course, you may not have to worry about uh, having to change this over and over. You, Five days later also if you open your computer and uh, connect it to the same port, uh, the port number would not change. But just in case your code uh, does not seem to work on the lunchbox, one of the reasons could be that this uh, port number has changed. So, it is no, not a bad idea to check with the, uh, you know, the device manager to find out, oh, is this uh, port number has changed uh, since the time that you uh, set this uh, in this uh, BSL uh, settings. If, if it has changed, please uh, make appropriate changes here. So, it is very important that you find out the port address to which you are going to connect your uh, uh, lunchbox and if it has uh, and that uh, address must reflect into the uh, BSL setting in this step 3. Once you are done, you are good to go. 
Now let's talk about the MSP430 compiler. It's a compiler uh, which accepts C, C++ commands. Uh, a, and it's good for 2014 version of the C++ language. Now, we are not going to go in this. Uh, uh, C, of course, has keywords which you cannot use in, uh, as names of uh, your subroutines and things like that. And here is a list of those uh, keywords. Please avoid these. Please, rec uh, please uh, uh, you know, understand these. Please familiarize uh, yourself with these keywords to ensure that you don't use them when you're writing your program. Now, what does a C program have? It, at the very minimum, it has a main loop. Right? That main loop indicates the entry point into the microcontroller or the microprocessor. It is compulsory and it will do a bunch of things as, uh, as reflected by the code that you write. But once all those commands, all those instructions are executed, where, where does uh, the main uh, loop take you? Well, actually it doesn't go anywhere. The micro, as long as the microcontroller is powered, it has clock and uh, it has memory, it will continue to execute some program. You may think that uh, the instructions that you have written, they are over, the microprocessor is now sleeping, it's not doing anything, but that's not the case. It actually has an infinite loop where it is jumping to itself. So it's, it could be something like this. Let's say the label is ABC, and it could say jump ABC. So it's like the equivalent uh, assembly command would be jump to itself. So it will be waiting. It's doing something. For you, it may not be doing anything uh, that is uh, visible, but it's actually doing something. And so, uh, you can explicitly have an uh, infinite while loop after your code uh, instructions are, uh, as you understand, is over. Uh, or if you don't, uh, the, uh, the C compiler will actually be executing some instructions. Now, what is inside a main, uh, the main loop? Well, what we do uh, in the context of MSP430 is that uh, we'll cover this. This is a watchdog timer. It's a very important feature of uh, uh, any microcontroller, and you need to configure it. So you can choose to have uh, it operational, or you can choose to uh, disable it, but you must deal with it. Then a microcontroller, and especially MSP430, has lots of options of the various uh, clock signals. So you need to set that up if you choose to. If you don't uh, set it up, the MSP430 works with some default clock, which is usually uh, born out of the DCO, and the frequency is 1.1 megahertz, and I'm talking in the context of MSP430 G2553 microcontroller. Then you need to do something to configure the ports and peripherals. That is, you may have output ports, and you want to say, you have ports, and you say, oh, I want these ports to be output, or some bits of those ports you want to be input, or some timer you want to work at certain frequency or some ADC you want to work at certain rate, you do these initializations. <coughs> After this, in case your code requires interrupts, you enable them. And then comes the actual meat of the program, which is basically uh, you're doing something repeatedly. <coughs> As an example, let me show you a structure of a embedded C program. As you see, Initially, we have all these uh, include files, which have uh, the prototypes of the functions that you are going to invoke, and many other things. And here is the main loop. Now, why we are doing this is, not only we want to uh, compare it with the uh, description of the uh, various elements in the main loop, but also something interesting. So here, this part, we have uh, disabled the watchdog timer, and you would understand what we are doing here once we cover the watchdog timer later on. Then we have called a function, which is initialize serial print on the lunchbox. Now, why we, why we are talking about it is, you see, uh, when you learn C programming on a compiler on your PC, uh, you had a great uh, mechanism to see the result of your program and that was the display. Unfortunately, on the microcontroller, there is no dedicated display. There is a display, very rudimentary display, but that display can only show binary information. And I am talking of, about of an LED. That LED is on, it has done something. If the LED is off, maybe it has done something else. But there is no way to print uh, verbose information, or it, uh, it appears to be like that. Well, 
if you have used the PC or laptop desktop to download code into your microcontroller, you could actually in principle use the display of your development host that is your laptop and desktop to display information. For that of course, you need the microcontroller needs to do a lot of things, it should be capable of doing serial communication and connect to the PC, but it does that is how you are uh, able to download the program from the C compiler into the memory of the microcontroller. And so, you could use the same channel through which you programmed the code from the uh, desktop into the memory of the microcontroller, you could use the same channel and use it after the code is working to print some information on your desktop computer. Of course, this would be useful only when you are building the code, when you are developing the code. This may, this, inf this uh, mechanism may not be available to you when the code is fully working and is installed in some application. But while you are developing the application, this is a great uh, resource. And for that, all you need to do is include this file into any program that you write. And then you could, as if you have the printf function that you, when you did your first C program, you did the hello world, right? And you use this printf function. It is like being able to use the printf function, except it is not going to print it uh, on the microcontroller's displays because your microcontroller display does not have, your microcontroller does not have a display like that. It is going to use the uh, display of the PC and display information. And in this case, what it is going to do here in this case, when you compile this code and download it into the memory of the microcontroller, it will print hello world and followed by a number. And that number is going to continuously increment going from 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. And this part of the loop is simply just delaying it so that you see that line for some time and then that line is updated, it is pushed up and a new line prints, it says hello world 2, hello world 3 and so on and so forth. And so, this is to illustrate that uh, we have some mechanism to debug the program or uh, use uh, the display of the PC as a means of uh, displaying verbose information or more critical information, maybe values of some, of some variables or some count that you want to display. Uh, it, this would be this part of the code function you would have to replicate in the code that uh, you want to, uh, that wants to use this uh, facility. And so, we are going to show you how to use it uh, very soon. Now, uh, the, uh, the, what are the elements of embedded C programming? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it has a library definition, it has a main function. Of course, only very simple programs would have only one main function and you can only have one main function. Uh, as you become experienced programmers, you would relegate many of the programming tasks to subroutines. And so, your program may have one or more subroutines. And if you are an embedded programmer, uh, that is what would distinguish you from conventional programmers is that you are going to include something called interrupt service routines. They are also subroutines except they will be invoked once when some event happens. That event could be you press a button or the event could be you receive a value from the serial port or the event could be that a internal timer uh, reaches some value and so on and so forth, which we are going to cover subsequent uh, in subsequent lectures when we talk about these peripheral features. But you are going to be adding interrupt sub service subroutines into the, uh, the C program. Now, uh, what how you manipulate data in a program is very important because at the end of the day, the program is doing nothing but uh, processing information, which is data. You uh, manipulate that data and you uh, store that data back in the memory or you send that data into an output port and so on so forth. So, we need to worry about understand what are the various types of variables that are available to you. Broadly, it is an integer variable, uh, character variable. It is You can also look at it as unsigned integer of a size 8. Integer is usually 16, but you can override that by saying no, I want to use an unsigned integer with, uh, with the 8 bits. You can have boolean type or you can have enumerated type of variables. Then you can modify the size by uh, using, uh, uh, you know, uh, before these uh, variables you say short int or you could say a long int that would modify the size of the int. And you could also uh, use these uh, variables which could be defined as unsigned or signed which basically reduces the uh, available numbers, but allows you to have plus and minus numbers also. 
Apart from that, the C keywords that are required to manipulate memory locations uh, are auto, in which uh, a, a variable is allocated in the stack memory, or you could have static, in which the uh, information will remain in a memory location. You can use an external definition in which uh, you want to access certain memory locations which are outside the scope of the current program, or you could use internal registers for storing information. Also, the variables that you have defined, you could also qualify uh, the way they operate, the way they are uh, managed by the compiler by saying that the information is constant. Of course, then it is not a variable, but you are saying here is a number that I do not want to change. Or here is a number which is stored in some memory location. Uh, the microcontroller often keeps a, could keep a copy of that uh, memory location into a register. And so, whenever it is needed, instead of bringing it from the memory location or a port, it could actually give you a local copy. And sometimes you do not want that local copy, you want the compiler to fetch it from the source, from right from the horse's mouth. And you have to tell the microcontroller, the C compiler that please bring the value of that variable right at the source. And one way to do that is to uh, add this keyword in front of the character or integer variable that you are declaring. For example, I could say int my underscore value, right. This would be a normal variable, but if I said uh, volatile int my value underscore, well you would still create a, a variable called my value, but you are saying that you know uh, the information uh, to be fetched from this variable has to be uh, brought from that location where it is created. A copy if it is being maintained should not be used to provide you whenever you need it. And so, usually we use this uh, keyword when we are looking at uh, exchanging information from an interrupt subroutine with the main program or from the main program into the interrupt subroutine. And of course, you would uh, get to know uh, it uh, when you see code examples that we discuss. The, here are the data types that are available in C. I do not need to repeat. This is very similar to what you may have already studied when you learned C programming. Of course, uh, we can, uh, there are many ways as I mentioned. Uh, usually, it would uh, suffice to have int and char and maybe a float type of uh, variable, but oftentimes you can use uh, u in t or u in 16. So, you are defining that it is an integer, but it is of 8 bit size or it is an integer of a 16 bit size. Of course, you need to know where these uh, header files uh, which define the these kind of data is available. So, if you are going to use this, you have to include int types to attach into the C program that you write. Well, now coming back to the whole point of using a serial debugger or a serial uh, print, here is the microcontroller lunchbox uh, that you would have received. Now, if you see here, there are, uh, we are going to use, we are underneath here, here is the U USB port and the USB port, uh, there is a chip underneath here which is a USB to UART converter which connects to appropriate UART pins on the microcontroller. Now, it turns out that there are two UART ports, so to say, one is a conventional UART port that is a serial communication port and the other is the port to be used when you want to use the USB to download program through the bootstrap loader from the PC into the memory of the uh, this microcontroller. And so, uh, you have to select some jumpers and that is being shown here. When you want to program, when you want to download the program, these jumpers should be on this side. And when you want to use this microcontroller and you want to use the USB to transfer information from the microcontroller into back to your PC then you must change the jumpers to these locations. So, that is what is the meaning as they are set here. So, right now, if you try to uh, connect this lunchbox to your uh, PC and compile the code and download it, it will not download. Why? Because it has not made the connection to the appropriate pins. So, be very uh, careful and sure that when you are downloading code, the jumper should be placed here. Let me uh, show it again here. When you are downloading code, the jumper should be uh, placed here. And when you, in case you want to uh, use the serial port to, the microcontroller needs to use the serial port to communicate to the PC while it is running, while your program is running, then you need to pull the jumpers from here and engage in the, these two holes.
So, there are three holes here 1, 2, 3 and three holes here 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So, you would short this and this when you want to do programming and if you are going to be using the serial port then you are going to you have three pins here again three here you are going to short this and this and this and this and then it would connect the uh, UART pins to the USB uh, to UART converter and it will allow the PC to receive values from the uh, microcontroller. Now once you have uh, the code in the C compiler you have to go uh, and build the project and you say build all and you do that rebuild then it will not only compile it will also download why because you already instructed that uh, once the code is compiled what is to be done with that code that it has to be downloaded through the uh, USB using the bootstrap loader facility into the microcontroller that is connected. And so when you do that if you were to compile this program that we were discussing earlier here if you compile this and downloaded it after you have downloaded it you change the jumper setting to connect to the UART this is uh, uh, you would start seeing the values on your PC but I missed a point that for the PC to show the values that are coming from the microcontroller you need to have a program running and that program is called putty it is a serial terminal emulator you can download it from this link. Now, in this also because there are many USB ports you could be communicating through any USB port you need to tell the putty uh, configuration uh, screen which port you are going to use. So, here in this case for example, it says COM60 of course not you uh, find out from the device manager which COM port uh, your uh, lunch box is connected to and you write that number and then the serial communication speed has to be set to 9600 because our microcontroller is going to be sending values at this rate. What this rate is and what does it mean we are going to cover when we do serial communication in one of those lectures. And then you <coughs> do uh, only on clean exit and then you open this alright. And then when you do it <coughs> and your program is running you have already downloaded the program and when it is running on your microcontroller this uh, putty window will open and here is what you will see hello world 1, 2, 3 and you will see every second or so this value is being updated. So, this is the way uh, uh, serial debugging could be implemented with the microcontroller. Now, once you are uh, happy with the way it is working you can use this feature later on and maybe in one of those lectures we will uh, one of the subsequent lectures will show how to use this serial uh, monitor uh, facility to print uh, intermediate information on your uh, PC for debugging purposes or for any uh, data you know monitoring purposes. Uh, right now let us uh, come back to using the uh, C uh, uh, programming language for issues related to uh, embedded C programming and one of the things that it needs to do is to manipulate bits because it is going to get information from the PC uh, from the various ports or value stored in the memory and then it needs to decide whether the number is 0 or whether a particular bit in this number is 1 or shift that bit uh, certain bits uh, to the left or to right. So, you need to know instructions which allow you to manipulate these bits and so instructions which allow you to uh, play with these bits is are called bit uh, manipulation uh, instructions and so we say for example, you want to set a particular bit in a variable. So, let us say the variable although this is not really a variable this is a port uh, that we are going to talk about uh, once we talk about the uh, digital input and output ports of microcontroller. But imagine that this port this could be as well this P1 dir could as well be a another variable and if that is initialized with the value 8 now 8 in decimal is uh, also 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 right. And so, we want to set certain bit what do you want to do we want to set the so this is 0 1 and 2 we want to uh, set the second bit. So, the way to do that is we want to uh, set the uh, second bit without uh, affecting the other bits and so what we do is we we'll, we did uh, that variable or with the variable which is shifted 
in which one is shifted two places to the left. And so once you OR it, this 8 is going to be ORed with the uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And so the result will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. This would be, this you would uh, get at this point. Now you want to uh, take the bit 7 uh, plus bit 6, that means uh, you want to set this and this bit and you want to OR it with the original value. And so when you, con when you execute all these three instructions, initial value loaded into the variable was 8, but after these two additional instructions, that is this and this, you would end up with this result. So please uh, go through this code and satisfy yourself that that is what it is going to happen. So this is a mechanism to set arbitrary bits in a, uh, in a variable. In this case, this variable happens to be a port address or a port location. Then you can clear certain bits, that is you can turn certain bits off and for that you use a AND function and you uh, AND it with the invert of that, so that particular bit becomes 0. Uh, so you have taken 1 and you have shifted it 3 digits to the left and then you invert that, so that particular bit becomes 0, rest all become 1. And so when you AND it, the other bits remain unaffected, the uh, bit 3, that is bit 0, 1, 2, 3, bit 3. Uh, is made 0. If it was 1, it will become 0. If it was 0, it will remain 0. Then you can flip bits using this uh, uh, these set of instructions. A particular bit, that is uh, bit number 5, and when I say 5, it means 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That bit needs to be uh, flipped. That is, if it was 1, it becomes 0. If it is 0, it becomes 1. And so, as you see, the number is 8. In this, this bit is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This bit is 0, when you execute it, this bit becomes 1. This is the operation to flip bits and here you can get a bit, that is you want to know a particular bit is the value 1 or 0. If it was 1, you would do something, if it was 0, you would do something else. This set of instructions will allow you to do it. How? You have initialized it with some value, now you want to know if the, a particular bit is 1, it will do something, if it is 0, it will do something else. You add the original value with 1 shifted 3 bits to the uh, left. And if the ending operation is 0, you do something. If it is non-zero, that is, is greater than 0, then you do something else here. And so these are the mechanisms to uh, play with various bits. You, you could uh, uh, you know, look at this code, which is available in the repository. Here it does lot of operations. You could modify them. And since we have included the serial print on the lunchbox, you would be able to see the result on the serial monitor and then you can see what it is doing. You could vary numbers here, change numbers here and uh, rerun the program, recompile, rebuild and download and you'll see, uh, you can, uh, you know, check your understanding of these instructions by predicting what number should come and see whether that number is coming. Now, uh, a lot of things that you would do on the microcontroller would deal with ports, read the ports, manipulate the value that you get from the ports and output it to some other port, all right? And so here is an example which if you would run right now, you would see that a bit connected on the LED connected on the lunchbox would blink at certain rate. For that, we have to tell the microcontroller that such a bit, such a LED is connected to such a port uh, which has a certain name. And uh, as we have, as we will see when we deal with the MSP430 architecture, that these ports on MSP430 G2553 microcontrollers, there are two ports, one is called P1, the other is called P2. And in our case, we have bit 7 of port 1, we have connected a LED. And so we are dealing with those ports using a name. These names are defined in this header file. And so we don't have to remember the addresses of those ports, we simply refer to them with these names. So it's like somebody has already declared a variable whose name is this, and you can deal with these names, manipulate information in uh, these locations. But it is possible to access those locations as memory addresses also because you see MSP430 is a von Neumann architecture which means the microcontroller or the processor inside has a unified memory map and in the same memory map you are going to store uh, the program. Some other parts of that same memory map are going to be used to store uh, variables because you have RAM there and some other locations are port addresses. So you could uh, look at a port 1 as a name, 
uh, available through this uh, header file or you can find out what is the address of port 1 and uh, directly access that memory location. So the same program I will show that you can get rid of this, you can remove this uh, hash include but then you would not, the C compiler would not recognize this p1 dir if you used it or p1 out if you used it, it would not know. So you need to replace it with the addresses of these two ports and the second example here identical, it just replaces it with the uh, memory address. In this case it is 22 and in this particular case it is 21 and the same program we are just uh, uh, you know commented out uh, the names of those ports and replaced them with the addresses and, and as you see here we have also commented out the uh, header file. So we are not using the information in the header file, we are directly writing into those memory locations even then the same program works. So the, the whole point of this exercise was to illustrate that when you are compiling uh, uh, code essentially all these instructions at the end of the day for a von Neumann architecture modify certain memory locations whether they are registers or whether they are uh, va variables or they are uh, constants they are all in the same memory map. If it was a Harvard architecture then of course there would be data memory for which you would need to deal with uh, those data memory in a different way and uh, you would have program memory and you would need to deal with that in a different way. In fact, here MSP 430 not only it is for Newman architecture but also that the ports are you can see ports in two ways, one is called uh, actual ports and the other is called memory map ports. In MSP 430 these ports are mapped into the memory map that is the port addresses are like memory locations which means any port can be seen as a memory location any memory location can be seen as a memory location and in fact this ex the point of this exercise was to show that a port is also a memory location and we can manipulate the information in the case of MSP 430. Why? Because it has a concept of memory mapped ports, ports which are seen as memory locations and if they are seen as memory locations their values can be manipulated by reading and writing to those memory locations. All you need to know is the address of that memory and this second exercise is actually to illustrate that once you know specific and exact address locations you do not need any uh, you know names to access those uh, ports or those memory locations you can directly read and write and when you read and write in this case you are actually changing the way the LED toggles. And so with this we cover uh, three important elements of our uh, journey uh, which is to understand what is uh, uh, version control system version control mechanism software for doing that uh, and in this case we have used git uh, with that uh, execution of that line you have pulled the repository uh, from the github website and you have created a local repository on your computer and then we installed the code composer studio then you saw how the code composer studio could be made to point at those uh, folders which contain these code examples you could uh, import them and you could uh, build them or you could modify them and once you rebuild them you would be able to download the code into the memory of the microcontroller and then a little bit about elements of embedded C programming. With this we finish this topic and I will come back with a new uh, lecture and deal with the various aspects of MSP 430 uh, architecture and programming and I will see you very soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.